Sometimes new, sometimes old, sometimes overlooked, but always worth a second look, these are Pair of Dice Paradise's picks for the Games of the Week. While crawling through a monster-infested dungeon is exciting and fun, sometimes the adventuring party just doesn't have the time to embark on a lengthy campaign. And that is where Dungeon Party comes in, a quick-playing fantasy role-playing romp designed to replicate the RPG dungeon delving experience while being played with coasters and a coin. It's published by Forbidden Games, who helped sponsor this episode and who is currently running a Kickstarter for it. Now, Dungeon Party here is a light dungeon crawler that includes classic RPG elements with a focus on being easy to learn, having a relatively short time frame, and being portable. Being able to be played in a bar, a restaurant, at home, a zoo parking lot, or sure, ironically, even a, a dungeon, I would suppose. Well, wherever you're playing it, the game starts by assembling a dungeon, which is represented by stacks of coasters, which include rooms, monsters, and treasures. Players then adventure through each room of the dungeon following its instructions, defeating the monsters and looting the treasure. To do so, each player takes a turn bouncing a coin onto the table in an attempt to hit the monster. And if the coin lands on the monster's coaster, then that monster's hit and takes damage. But that's often easier said than done and way easier said than trying to capture it on camera. But if the player's attack misses, then their character takes damage. And if their hit points ever reach zero, well then they are knocked out of that battle. And if the entire party gets knocked out, then the players have been defeated and everyone loses. Otherwise, after defeating the monster, everyone heals up and continues on to the next room. And along the way, players will discover magical treasures and spells which will further help them on their quest. And then, once the last monster is defeated, the party is victorious, and the player who collected the most treasure wins the dungeon party. When your idyllic island paradise begins to sink into the sea, well then it's every meeple for themselves as players scramble to the neighboring islands dodging sharks and other predators by any means necessary to survive. In Survive, each player controls 10 meeples, with values ranging from 1 to 6, as they rush to relocate to safety before their island home floods, sinks, and eventually blows up. And if that happens, well then the island takes any unevacuated meeples left on it to a watery doom. But players can still escape by boat, or even have their meeples swim to safety, as long as they can avoid the sea serpents, whales, and sharks along the way. Survive was first published in 1982 by Parker Brothers, and then was reintroduced by Stronghold Games in 2010 as Survive Escape from Atlantis. Then, in 2015, a new variation, Survive Space Attack, which, which is on, on, on its way around, was released, and in this version, Space Station Atlantis, where the player's meeples reside, has come under attack by the hostile alien invaders. And so, the crew of meeples must rush to flee the station via escape pods, or choose to fight back by boarding fighters and attempt to destroy the aliens. Survive Space Attack is based on the rules for Survive Escape from Atlantis while adding some new features, including a double-sided game board, fighter ships, which give players the ability to capture and redeploy alien creatures, laser turrets, which are a new way to defend the space station against alien invaders, new tile abilities, and new alien creatures which can combine to become even more formidable foes. Now, while both of these games in the Survive line do have some bite to them, they still make for some great gateway games, introducing new players to what the tabletop gaming hobby has to offer, as long as those players are comfortable with some of the cutthroat decisions that they and their opponents may be forced to make in order to survive. The first settlers arrived on Mars in the year 2037, and soon, private companies began work on creating a self-sustaining colony. As chief astronaut of one of these enterprises, you want to pioneer the development of the biggest, most advanced colony on Mars. In On Mars, each player's goal is to develop a self-sustaining Martian colony independent of any terrestrial organization. As the colony expands, players will shift their focus to constructing mines, power generators, water extractors, greenhouses, oxygen factories, and shelters. 
All of this stuff will require understanding the importance of water, air, power, and food, the necessities for survival on Mars. And this survival is accomplished over several rounds, each consisting of two phases, the shuttle phase and the colonization phase. In the shuttle phase, players may travel between the colony and the space station in orbit around the planet. During the colonization phase, players have different actions that are available to them depending on their current location. If in orbit, they can take blueprints, buy and develop technologies, and take supplies from the warehouse. However, if on the surface of the planet, they can construct or upgrade buildings, gain scientists and new contracts, welcome new ships, or explore the planet's surface. Sounds easy enough, but players should know that buildings must be carefully planned. Uh, for example, building shelters for colonists requires oxygen, and generating oxygen requires plants, and growing plants requires water, and extracting water from ice requires power, generating power requires mining minerals, and mining minerals requires colonists. So good luck with that. During the game, players are also trying to complete missions. And once a total of three missions has been completed, well then the game ends and the player with the most victory points, called opportunity points, is declared the winner on Mars. In a distant future, scientists discover alternate Earths, each with their own individual sets of laws and rules that govern them. And so far, the door to 504 alternate Earths has been unlocked, and you can visit all of them in the appropriately named 504, which is designed by Friedman Fries, is a board game that consists of 504 different individual board games all in one box. This achievement is done through the game's unique rule set, which mixes and matches a selection of nine different modules to create a potential of 504 different rules, resulting in a variety of different games focusing on combinations of mechanisms, such as pick up and deliver, plus racing, plus military conflict, or exploration, or roads and pathways, or area majority, or production, or shares, and stuff like that. For example, you could play a racing game that expands through exploration with technology improving the racing or exploration, which would be World 253. Or you could play an 18xx style game with network building, which would be World 968. Or a war game with a pick up and deliver economy and bonus scoring for majorities, which would be World 417. And each of these variations varies widely in its game length, from 30 to 120 minutes. Now, I, I really like 504, but, but I do think that I actually appreciate it more as a creative design exercise than, than as a game to play. Uh, some criticisms of 504 have been that the game tries to do too much. It, it, it introduces nine distinct mechanisms into this mix, while not actually mastering any single one of them. And the result is a box that packs hundreds of different games within it, albeit hundreds of potentially mediocre games. Still, if you're curious about how this game system can work, this is definitely worth a look. 504 here remains on my shelf to this day, if for no other reason than the admiration of what it seeks out to do, and ultimately does, accomplish. Is, is this game, 504, on your shelf as well? If so, how many of its 504 possible permutations have you played? Now share a comment and let me know which combination is your favorite. You might think that life as a houseplant is easy, but they'll tell you otherwise if you actually take the time to speak to them after hitting your head on something heavy. And no other game out there better captures the perils of seedling survival than Conflict of Plants, designed by Armando Canales and Armand D. Tulio and self-published in 2016. Today, January 10th, is Houseplant Appreciation Day, an official day to acknowledge the benefits of your houseplants. Houseplant, I appreciate you in the way that you photosynthesize carbon dioxide into oxygen. But I'm not going to apologize for forgetting to water you for weeks on end because you're just a houseplant and there's nothing you can do about it. Except perhaps get brittle and die. In Conflict of Plants, various shrubs compete to be the most successful wild plant. And even though players will use their resources to best support their plant's success, at its core, this is actually an action selection and area control game, but one with a twist, in that the environment does not always favor the most abundant species. 
The game consists of six rounds, during which, first, the players with the fewest points swap two tokens on the board for a couple of randomly chosen replacements, which will determine the opportunities that are available for the players that round. Then, each player sends their cubes to tiles that have icons that match the icons played to their player mat, and then they perform one action three times. Players then place brown tokens onto empty corners of the map tile, which then determines how many points and additional brown tokens the players receive for that round. Each region is then balanced by removing cubes from each tile until the total number of player cubes is equal to, or less than, each region's number. The game Conflict of Plants is certainly obscure, but still, it may just be the perfect game for your next garden-based game day. Whether you're a tabletop gamer or an interstellar life form that just enjoys dice, you'll absolutely adore hanging this playful pair of Dice Paradise shirt upon your body. Unless you're a being of pure energy that has no corporal form, in which case you could, I don't know, use it as a dish rag.